Grace, mercy, and peace are yours in abundance from God our Father and our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The text we're meditating on this morning is the gospel lesson you heard from Mark chapter 1. Having just heard it, let us bow our heads in prayer. Lord God, open now our hearts and our minds, that we may better come to know and to understand your word. Sanctify us by the truth. Your word is truth. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, a trope, or maybe not a trope, a theme, uh, so, something you'll sometimes see in the arts, in sports, even in regular everyday people is sometimes you can just tell, even early on, what a person is going to do with their life, what a person is destined for, if you will. Last week we spoke a little bit about Mozart, the child prodigy who already at a very young age was composing music and how was in, in the span of his life composed a complete piece of music about every two weeks if you average his life out in the number of works he created. From very early on, people knew Mozart was going to be a musical prodigy. And there are lots of people much like Mozart. There's also Pablo Picasso one of the most well-known and well-renowned painters of the modern era. It was said that Picasso could draw before he could talk. And when he did speak, the very first words he asked his mother was for a pencil, so he could draw something. Maybe a bit more of a modern application, another name that I'm sure you're all very well familiar with is that of LeBron James, who is considered by many to be one of the greatest basketball players to have ever played the game alongside Michael Jordan. He's another example of someone who from very early on in his sports career, as a grade schooler, as a high schooler, people knew he was going to be a legendary player. I'm sure you can all think of examples like that too. Famous artists, athletes, actors, people who were destined for greatness. They knew what they were going to do very early on in their lives. But just because the, the, these people went on to greatness doesn't mean that that's that they have a monopoly on knowing early on what you're going to do with your life. Many times when we have kids, or as we're growing up, we see those children develop skills that will be of great use to them later in life. A child is very outgoing and isn't afraid to speak in the presence of others. This may indicate that this child has a, has a career destined as a lawyer or someone who does public speaking on a regular basis. If a kid is really good with numbers, they may be destined for a career uh, in accounting or working with various uh, mathematical equations. If someone's quick with their hands or they're tall, you might think that they're going to be a good athlete when they're in high school. And that, that may be of use to them in the career field. Sometimes it's pretty easy to tell what a person is destined for early on in life. But if we look at the way people react to Jesus, especially in his early ministry, I think it's safe to say that people really didn't know what Jesus was destined for or why he had come at all. As Jesus begins his earthly ministry, especially if you read the early parts of the Gospels, you'll see Jesus is primarily doing three things. He is healing people, casting out demons, and he is preaching the good news. And it definitely seems like people got this impression, especially early on in Jesus' ministry, that he came to be a healer, or to be a, a guy who would provide miraculous bread, or as people got to know him more as the slayer of the Romans, the leader of, God, of God's people Israel, who would restore the golden age of Israel. But Jesus here shows us very clearly why it is he came. He tells us straight up in the end of the gospel lesson why he came. That is to save the lost, to preach the gospel, to cleanse their disease and, and, hear, and heal them of their sickness. And so today we treasure why our Savior came. This is why he came, to seek and to save the lost. Now our gospel lesson for today is a direct continuation of the gospel lesson we heard in this very place just last week. Jesus is at the very start of his ministry. He is, 
He has his disciples. He has been baptized in the River Jordan. He has a small following, and he has a mission, a plan, and a purpose. He is going to go in the, in the region of Galilee and proclaim the good news. <clears throat> in the early part of Jesus' ministry, he sets up shop in a fishing village called Capernaum. Now, the whole region of Galilee was small and kind of backwards by the more sophisticated standards of the people in Jerusalem. But Capernaum was a step above that. Capernaum was big enough that they had their own synagogue. It's likely it was a trade hub for people who did business in the region of the northern part of Galilee. And it's a good first stop on Jesus' tour of ministry. Jesus walks into town, and as is his custom, and as Mark often says, immediately Jesus goes to the synagogue. Time and again in Jesus' life, we see he has a plan, a purpose. He's going to his father's house. He's doing his father's work of preaching and teaching to God's chosen people. While Jesus is there, we see a story that we see many times, especially in Mark's gospel. A demon-possessed man confronts him, calls him out for who he really is, the Son of God. Now, of course, Jesus knows that this is not the source from which he wants his ministry to be talked about. The demon is cleansed. The people are amazed. What is this? A new teaching and with authority. Capernaum was big by Galilean standards, but it was still a small town. Word travels fast in a small town like that. Jesus finishes up his day at the synagogue. He goes home, and before the crowds come, we see a very interesting exchange between Jesus and the family of Simon Peter. Mark tells us with no embellishments that Peter is married. He has a mother-in-law who is living with him, as well as his brother Andrew. So this is a pretty big house. When Jesus gets there, you think he would expect a nice warm meal after his day of teaching in the synagogue, his work of driving out a demon. But they come to find out that Peter's mother-in-law is sick with a fever. It's interesting to note here that we're never told this was life-threatening. We're not told that she's on the verge of death or that they're fearing for this woman's life. No, she was just simply in bed sick. Just like you and I get sick. We, get, we catch a cold, we run a fever, we lay in bed for a day or two until we feel better. Already, though, we see Jesus is, is a man who is concerned with more than just the fame or celebrity of his station. He's concerned with more than just preaching and teaching and casting out demons. Jesus is a healer. Someone who is willing to reach out a hand and grab a woman who isn't deathly ill, but is just sick and suffering. Jesus heals her, they have a meal, and after a long day, Jesus takes some well-deserved rest. Again, we might think that this is a point where Jesus, you know, he's going to want to sleep in. He's been working hard, you know, he's been traveling, he, that he's done a lot of work, but what does Jesus do? First thing in the morning. The Greek here is pretty specific. It says, at very early in the morning, at first light, even before first light, Jesus is up, going to a quiet place and seeking the counsel and comfort of his Father in heaven. We've already seen clear example that Jesus is a Savior on an intimate level. He approaches people. He goes into their homes. He lives and works with them. He's not bound by societal standards. He's okay reaching out and touching a woman or ministering to her, which, which was, was uncommon in Jesus' day and age. Men and women were kind of separate from each other. But all more than that, we see as, as intimate and close as Jesus is with the people he came to minister to, Jesus is even closer with his Father in heaven. The two are one in person, mind, and spirit. Jesus is God. He is God in the flesh. And he can't do anything without his Father's aid. He needs to be constantly grounding himself in God's word. Seeking out these quiet places. Distancing himself from the pride and the fame and the glory that comes with his station as Messiah. And instead grounding himself in his Father's mission. The reason he came which is to seek and to save the lost. Jesus, of course, is not left alone for very long. 
Does his disciples come and say, hey, everyone's looking for you. Where have you been? We've got work to do, Jesus. Again, if I'm in Jesus' shoes here, I'm going to be a little annoyed. I've worked my tail off all day yesterday preaching and healing people. And now you want me to go and go and help more people? I came here on my own to seek some quiet time with God. Can I not get five minutes to myself? No, Jesus doesn't think any of that. Jesus instead impresses once again on us his mission. He told them, let's go somewhere else to the neighboring villages so that I can preach there too. In fact, that is why I have come. And he went throughout the whole region of Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Jesus came to preach. Jesus came to save. Jesus came to be a beacon of hope for the lost. A lot of the times, I already mentioned, in Mark's Gospel especially, we see demons as a constant recurring theme. Jesus is encountering them often in his work. He is always warring against them and having to struggle and cleanse them from faithful people. Some people wonder why demons in particular are so common in the Gospels. Well, I think it's pretty obvious, right? If you read the service introduction for this week, Martin Luther had an excellent quote where God builds a church, Satan sets up a chapel. Satan is wholly and entirely dedicated to undoing the Lord's work. That was his goal from the very beginning. He is the antithesis to what God is and what God says. God is truth. He shines light in the dark. He brings people to him. Satan, however, is lies. The very first thing he did was to, was to undermine God's truth with the lie told to our first mother that God was holding out on his people. Satan is always going to oppose God's work. And so and naturally it makes sense that when Jesus is going out and preaching the good news, the devils and all his forces are going to be there undermining him trying to destroy his work. And Satan does so in our lives as well, my friends. We may not encounter demons the way Jesus did, but he's there. He is actively hunting you down like a, like a lion stalks its prey. It's pretty obvious that Satan's got America right where he wants it, isn't it? America is so self-indulgent and deluded. It believes that the Bible is fairy stories that, uh, that only the old-fashioned need to hold on to. That the devil isn't real and that demons aren't real. That there's no heaven, there's no hell, there's no morality. There's just modern embracing culture. The devil doesn't need demons to go out and do his dirty work. He's got the sins of pride and self-centeredness and vanity to do his work for him. And Satan, unfortunately, uses those tricks very well even in God's own people, in God's own church. He actively sows deceit and doubt, and, and he makes good Christian people doubt their faith. He leads God's people away, telling them that they don't need to go to church all that often. They don't need to do everything the Bible says. They know the truth, and that truth sets them free. He deludes regular Christians into thinking that their pet sins that they hold on to so covetously aren't really that big a deal. That they don't need to worry about their lives, that they don't have to live the way God calls them to as long as they put up appearances to make it seem like God's people are here, that everything will be all right. One of the things that stood out to me in this text in particular is look at how the people sought after Jesus. How they were seeking him out, even early in the morning, after they had just spent a whole day with him, hearing him preach, seeing him heal. They wanted more of Jesus. What about you and me? Do we pursue our Savior like that? Do we seek him out and we can't get enough of him, even after a day in church? Or is, something, or is the busyness of life something that gets in the way instead of us following our Savior and doing what he wants for us? 
Satan is actively at work, prowling around the way he does, disrupting God's people. We need to be watchful, my friends. But more than that, we need to find ourselves in our Savior. This is why Jesus came, to oppose the devil's work. Jesus batters down those walls that, that Satan throws between us and God. He actively and aggressively pursues you, his lost child. He seeks you out with his word and sacrament. He reminds you richly and daily that you are forgiven, no matter how many times Satan tries to convince you otherwise. He actively sanctifies you, keeps you holy, keeps you strong in the faith through words of encouragement, prayers, Bible passages that rattle around in your head, good Christian people being an encouragement in our thoughts and lives. God strengthens us with a reminder that we're baptized, and whenever we think that we are unable to be children of God, we're reminded that the waters of baptism say otherwise. Whenever we feel weak in our faith, we can come here and receive a physical, touchable, tasteable assurance that Jesus really did die. He gave his body for you. He shed his blood for you. And that forgiveness still works today. Satan may build his chapels, but God's church is built of living bodies. People who go out and encourage and do so on a personal level. Again, notice how when the disciples brought Jesus to Peter's mother-in-law, what do they do first with her? They told her about Jesus. How many of us did our journeys start with a family member? A parent bringing us to the font of baptism. A grandparent sitting with us on Sunday morning or when we're visiting them, teaching us a Bible story. A teacher having us memorize a Bible passage or telling us a Bible story. How many of these people, friends, families, start close to the heart? Jesus works through physical, personal means, in homes, in families, just like yours and mine. That, my friends, is how Jesus undermines his work. That is how he comes into our homes today. What we do here on Sunday morning is incredible, but this is just one hour of one week. Your home is where you spend most of your time. And that is where, my friends, you need to be fighting Satan on the front lines doing family devotions, praying together, reading scripture, letting Jesus come and show you how he came to save you. So my friends, may that be an encouragement and a reminder to us this morning. This is why Jesus came. To destroy Satan's work once and for all. To give us eternal life and an assurance that it is ours and ours forever. But don't just let Jesus come to you here let Jesus come to you in your homes as well. Actively seek him there and be blessed by his great encouragement and love for you. May God grant this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Please stand. <clears throat> and the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard and keep your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. <clears throat>